Hi, I'm Zor. Welcome to Unizor Education. Um, today I would like to talk about specific uh, kind of equilibrium, equilibrium of a point object. So we have some kind of a point object which is a point with certain mass and we're talking about equilibrium, conditions on equilibrium and kinds of equilibrium of this particular case. Now this lecture is part of the course Physics 14 presented on Unizor.com I recommend you to, to go to the website to watch this lecture because it has uh, parallel text uh, notes for every lecture, including this one. Also, um, there is a prerequisite course on the same website, which is which is called Math for Teens. Um, you do have to know math to to succeed in physics on the level which we are talking about right now. Uh, and the site is completely free, there are no advertisements, so I do suggest you to go to the unizor.com plus there are certain exams which you can take uh, if you want, it's completely anonymous if, 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 if you want to. Obviously you can sign on and basically your history of exams will be preserved. Alright, so um, equilibrium of the point. Now, point is characterized by it's three coordinates in our three-dimensional world. Obviously we will call them x-coordinate, y-coordinate and z-coordinate. Now, as we know from the previous lecture about equilibrium, that equilibrium means basically that all the forces which are acting on the particular uh, object are balanced, which basically means, very simply, that sum of all the forces as vectors let's say we have n different forces which are acting on the same point object and their vector sum is supposed to be a null vector now if that's the case then we are talking about equilibrium well now this is some kind of an equation basically it's a condition on the forces to be satisfied for the object to be in equilibrium. Well, um, when talking about equation, we are usually talking about algebraic equations. Now, this is a vector equation, so how can we translate it into algebraic form so we can basically solve the, the equation? Well, very simply. Um, every force has, again, three coordinates, because any vector can be expressed as the sum of its three projections. So if you have x, y, and z coordinates, and there is some kind of a vector, we can always project this vector onto x, y. So this is y coordinate, this is x coordinate, and on the z, this is z coordinates. So this is f, y, this is f, x and this is f z. So the vector f is equal to f x plus f y plus f z. Well, actually I put it on the upper index, I'm sorry. We need the bottom for different purposes. Now, in this particular case, we can always express this condition as condition on each component, namely f i x plus f i y plus f i z. This is my f i, right? equals to zero, where i index i goes for every vector. Now, I can make a slight correction of this, well, not correction, but transformation, rather. I will summarize not these uh, vectors in these orders, which means first, for i is equal to one, I summarize f first x component plus f first y component plus f one z component getting 
basically the, the, the overall F1. Instead, I will do it separately. I will do all X's and all Y's and all Z's. So basically it's like three different kind of things. It's sum of Fx, uh, no, Fi, X plus sum of F I Y plus sum of F I Z equals to zero vector. These are all vectors so far, right? Now, but let's think about it. All Fx are collinear. They're all within the uh, x-axis. They're all projections of f i onto the x axis, right? So they're all collinear, and their sum is also um, some kind of a vector along the x axis, right? Again, if these are my coordinates, so all f axis are here, of different lengths, obviously, and maybe different direction along the x-axis, but they're all collinear, they're all within the same line, they're all projections of fi, wherever it is, onto the x-axis. So, if they are all collinear, their sum is basically an algebraic sum, so I can um, have this whole, um, I, I can have a sum of these magnitudes with, with proper signs, plus or minus, depending on the direction, but I can add as magnitudes. So this would be f um, i without the vector sign, and this will be my x component of zero of null vector, and the x component of the null vector is obviously null. So this is an x component of this vector. This is y component because all these vectors are along the y um, axis. And this is again a z component of this, which means all of these and all of these must be, if I will summarize algebraically all the magnitudes with a proper sign, they must be equal to zero. So this is not a vector equation anymore. This equals to zero is a plain algebraic equation where f i x sorry where i uh, where f i x is x component of the f i vector and same thing obviously for y sum of f i y is equal to zero and same thing for z sum of f i z is equal to zero. So what do we have as a result? As a result of this equation and representation of each vector as sum of its component, we have three algebraic equations, namely sum of f i x equals to zero, sum of f i y equals to zero as sum of f i z equals to zero where f i x f i y and f i z are correspondingly x y and z components um, of the vector f i now these are three algebraic equations and this is a condition algebraic if you wish condition for a point to be in equilibrium, to basically be uh, in the state of rest, so to speak, right? Now, there are only three equations. What does it mean? It means that if we would like to find the forces which are acting on a particular sub uh, on a particular object, which result in this object to be in equilibrium, we should not have more than n unknown variables, right? So forces are, if they are completely independent, and there are a lot of them, then we will not be able to resolve this 
um, system of equation in in certain unique way. There are no unique solutions in this case. We will have more um, variables, unknown variables, than the equations. So basically, that's what it is. If you have a system which contains a point object and certain number of forces which act on it, if we will be able to find no more than three unknowns from which these forces depend upon, and I will give you an example, then we can uniquely identify these forces. Otherwise, there are infinite number of solutions, most likely, and, uh, and the system would not have a unique solution. Now, let me just make a very simple example of this. Let's consider you have a chandelier which is hanging on three threads. So you have three threads from the ceiling. So this is the ceiling. And these are three points. Now, these are three points from which we have hanging uh, on a thread. from underneath, right? So this is the ceiling. Okay, and uh, this is our chandelier. Now let's assume for simplicity that we know we know the weight of this chandelier. Let's also assume that these three points where it's hanging from are forming a, an equilateral triangle and these threads are of equal si uh, e equal lengths, which is ob obviously the typical situation. Now, um, my purpose is to find out the force of tension on each thread, so I will be able to use a proper material, like a chain or, or, I don't know, or, or a thread or a... Um, a rope or something else. So I have to calculate, based on the weight, I have to calculate what's the tension on each thread. Now, all I need right now is basically to know certain things about geometry of this. So what I probably need as the smallest um, kind of amount of information and only one particular parameter from which everything else depends, I should know what kind of an angle with vertical each thread makes. So if you have some kind of a vertical, it goes from the center of this triangle down to the uh, chandelier, and I know the angle between these uh, threads with the vertical. Let's call it phi. So if I know W and I know phi, now I can actually determine um, the threads, the, the forces, the, the tension forces on, on each thread very easily. Why? Well, because if this, well, because of the consideration of symmetry, obviously the tension should be exactly the same because this is the equilateral triangle and equal lengths of the of the threads, so it's supposed to be evenly distributed. So there is a force of tension here, here, and here. There are three forces of tension and they must be equal to each other. So if this is tension T, then in the vertical direction from this particular force T, I have T times cosine phi. Right? So if my vector t can be um, represented as the sum of two vectors, the vertical and horizontal. Now, horizontal doesn't really do anything in the vertical direction, right? And all the horizontal components are acting in different, in three different directions, basically. At, well, if I will look at this from the top, I will have these three at 120 degree 
each and they will nullify each other so that's why my chandelier doesn't move horizontally but as far as the vertical is concerned we should really neutralize the weight right so three times of these because all of these projections from this force from this force and from this force on each thread tension on each thread projection on the vertical they're all collinear and that's why their sum would be just algebraic sum of their magnitudes and that must be equal to w from which t is equal to w divided by 3 cosine phi so what does it mean well first of all it means that if my angle is close to zero then I will have this cosine of phi close to one now as my angle is increasing so I'm separating the point from from where I'm hanging further and farther from each other so making my threads instead of this I will make it this they are further from the vertical that actually makes cosine um, smaller and smaller and since it's a denominator the tension will be greater and greater all right now imagine as our points of hanging is separating further and further and my uh, thread from the vertical becomes more and more closer to the 90 degree because the point of hanging is really going further and further well the cosine of 90 degrees is zero so the whole thing is um, is going to infinity so the further we are from the vertical in our threads the tougher will be to hang really um, uh, the chandelier and if it's 90 degrees as I was saying it's really uh, infinity will be which means that if you have um, these threads hanging not from the ceiling but let's say from the walls okay so if you have a room this is the room I'll just uh, have one particular and instead of a ceiling you are trying to hang your chandelier from the walls and you don't want this chandelier to go um, to go really deep you would like it to be almost in the same height where your attachment points are that's impossible so whenever in case your chandelier is exactly at the same level as these points of hanging this will be 90 degree and that's why the cosine will be zero and the whole and the tension force will be infinite so it must hang down you cannot horizontally um, hang the chandelier all right so that's all about chandeliers now we have three different types of um, equilibrium this is simple and quick let me just draw the picture and you will know what I'm talking about now what happens if I have let's say a cup a semi-spherical cup and you have a small ball uh, at the bottom well at the bottom it just sits there right and uh, the weight is equal to reaction force of the cup and it actually stays in place in equilibrium now what happens if I will move it off the equilibrium point let's say I'm moving my ball into this position now my weight still goes here my my reaction is always perpendicular to a surface right so the perpendicular to a surface would be something like this this is reaction force this is my no this is my weight so what would be the result uh, the resultant of these two vectors it would be this force which forces our ball back to the original position of equilibrium so if we will um, move it off 
the position of equilibrium, it will return back. So this is basically called a stable equilibrium. Now let's talk about a little bit more rigorous definition of the stable. How far can I move this particular um, object, in this case the ball, from the position of stable equilibrium so it will still return back? Just think about my condition can be something like this. What if I have something like this? If I will move my ball within this interval from here to here, it will return back. But if I will move it a little bit further, it will go away, right? So the stable equilibrium is an equilibrium when there is some kind of a neighborhood within which I can really um, move this object uh, from the equilibrium point. So around the equilibrium point must be some kind of a neighborhood when um, the object would return back into the equilibrium point. Now, how big is supposed to be this neighborhood? Well, it actually can be any, as long as it's not zero. So basically the um, relatively rigorous definition of, equilib of stable equilibrium is it's such an equilibrium where exists some kind of a epsilon neighborhood and from the mathematics you know what I mean epsilon neighborhood um, of the point of the equilibrium um, where if I will move it within this neighborhood epsilon neighborhood it will return back and obviously uh, it's supposed to be strictly greater than zero that's what definition of a stable um, equilibrium is. Well, if you again remember the mathematics, um, there is a um, concept of a continuity of the function and there is also like epsilon and delta neighborhoods are involved. Argument is supposed to be uh, no larger than something if you would like that the, uh, the, the, the function value to be deviated from another no more than something, epsilon delta. In this case, it's just one particular epsilon neighborhood where epsilon is greater than zero must exist, however small. So it can be one millimeter or it can be one micron. But as long as there is such a neighborhood of the point of equilibrium, this particular point of equilibrium is called a stable uh, equilibrium point. Okay, now, what is unstable? Well, look at the second picture. At the second picture, obviously, in this case, we do have some kind of an equilibrium. But, as soon as I will move it by any value of the equilibrium point, it will immediately go out from the equilibrium. So, basically, the definition of unstable is that there is no such epsilon greater than zero, there is no such epsilon neighborhood around the point of equilibrium where my return will be guaranteed. No matter how small epsilon is, there is always some point within that epsilon neighborhood where I move my um, my object, it will immediately go out from the um, from the equilibrium point. This is unstable. And finally, the neutral. Well, on a horizontal plane, obviously, this particular object, this ball, can have any uh, basically point as a uh, point of equilibrium. Now, if I will move it from the equilibrium point, it will not return back, but it will not go away. It will just stay where it is, right? So this is a neutral. So this picture is, uh, I think, very um, good illustration of the concepts of stable, unstable, and neutral um, equilibrium. And this basically completes my uh, discussion of the equilibrium for point objects. Now my next lecture will be about solids 
And with solids, we have a little bit more complicated story. Why? Well, because solids can rotate. Now, the point object can move in three different directions. So it has three different degrees of freedom, as we are saying. Along x, along y, and along z axis. Now, whatever the combination of these movements along these three um, axes uh, is, basically, uh, basically tells about what kind of a freedom of movement uh, my object can have. So it can move freely within any direction on the x-axis, any direction on y-axis, and any direction on z-axis. Okay, what about the solid? If you have a, a solid, then it can also rotate around x-axis, rotate around y-axis, and rotate around z-axis. So these are additional three uh, degrees of freedom. So the solid has six degrees of freedom. Well, unless there are some restrictions. I mean, we can think about constructual restrictions when the solid can move only around one particular axis. Um, but in any case, in theory, if everything is free, then these rotations around each of the three axes also uh, give certain uh, degree of freedom and if we are talking about equilibrium, we should really think about the rotation. So we basically know how to deal with um, movement along the uh, translational, basically, movement along the coordinate uh, axis. Um, and now we will talk, on the next lecture, uh, we will talk about rotation. And basically, what I'm um, actually saying is that rotation around any axis can be really represented as rotation around x-axis, around y-axis, and around uh, z-axis. So, any kind of a rotation, whatever the uh, rotation this particular uh, object uh, has, the solid object has, it can always be represented as rotation around three different coordinate axes, in as much as any movement within the space can be represented as movement along the x, y, and z um, axis. And that would be uh, what we will discuss uh, at the next lecture. Thank you very much. That's it for today.